Welcome back, huh? Hey. So, uh, this is my first official meeting as president. Yeah. And uh, like to always start out with a joke, but I've already ruined the joke. Tell on uh, we had the winter meeting a couple of days ago. You said how many days still spring training? Forty <laughs> something. I'll, I'll have to recompute. Uh, right now would be. Um, it'd be in the 40s, I would guess. Okay. All right. Thanks. Let's hope we have screen training, <laughs> right? So, um, as Tal said uh, at the meeting, both sides know what's uh, what the stakes are. So, let's hope they get together. Um, before we officially get started, though, as all of you know, I took over for a man that I met in 2010. And I met him at Astros Fan Fest. What was it really a fan fest? It was that last spring training game. The Astros DJs 2010. Yeah. They had done it. Okay. But I just happened to be walking by and I saw this uh boot that said Saber on it. You know? And I love sports. And that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was in college to uh get a degree in history, but I wanted to write about baseball. Because my entire life uh, has been about studying baseball. And I decided my whole life was going to be about studying baseball. Because pretty much after T-ball, I figured out I wasn't going to be a major league player. <laughs> so, you know, I was okay hitting the ball up the stick. But once people started throwing at me, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. So, but anyway, I met Bob and uh, a couple of people. I want a trivia contest. It was, I think I got three questions, right? You know, a few times in the entire time I've been at Sabre that I've actually won a trivia contest. And I've been here for what, 11 years now, so I'm in a room full of experts. So every once in a while. But you actually got the 86 Astros. I think I won that one. <laughs> so been that thing for. But before we really get started today, I have some big shoes to fill. All right, we all know Bob. He's president of this chapter for the last 18 years. And I just, hey, how's it going? And I just uh, really felt like, you know, I, I, I just hope I do half as good as Bob did for the last 18 years. Um, but I guess before we get to that, let's welcome, we have some visitors here. Okay. And a few of you just met. So we have Diane and Lauren Langdon. Lauren is actually a student at U of H downtown. Uh, so, hey, go Cougs. All right. All right. We have uh, Nick Thornquist and Megan McCroskey. You don't recognize that last name? Well, hey, Mr. Mike McCroskey. So, and uh, I forgot. Your name? Tim Healy. Tim Healy. Yes. The reason Tim Healy found out about this meeting is his son was in my history class <laughs> last year. The fact that he's here, I didn't know if I was in trouble. <laughs> but he was like, hey, I, I really wanted to come and check it out because my son told me um, about Saber. So, and join tonight. We would love to have you. In fact, all of you. We'd love to have all of you. Uh, we just love to talk baseball. That's all we really like to do. And we also have a special guest, very special guest tonight. Someone I am very fond of because I grew up a radio guy. All right. But we'll get more to him here in a second. But we do have, of course, Robert Ford and his daughter, Elena. Okay. Now that I got those introductions out the way. Mr. McCann, Bob, come up here for a second, please. I know you don't like this, but hey, Bob. You thought Bob and I sort of got together. We didn't really tell anybody. Yeah. And we are very fortunate to tell you. And uh, we just thought we would get you something, you know, as sort of a going away. Thank you. Well, going away, you're not really going anywhere. 
That was sort of a thank you and appreciation for everything you've ever done for me personally, for Bob and this entire chapter, and really for the people, the city of Houston, you know, bringing Sabre, making Sabre larger, this whole community. I think you had a yeah. lot to do with that. Absolutely. You know, so, yes, got you a little gift. Okay. And I, small little speech. Go ahead. I was reading this book about this uh, fellow who played first base for Yale named George Herbert Walker Bush. And I was reading this book, had all the speeches in there, including his uh, acceptance speech back in 1988 at the Republican Convention. He said, we're a nation of community of thousands and thousands of religious, social, business, community organizations spread across the country, doing all kinds of things. Uh, brilliant diversity spread like stars, a little thousand points of light across broad and peaceful sky. And I Think about what you've done, about Saber. Um, you know, it's our little, our little point of life. You know, this happy room once a month, getting together, talking about baseball, learning about baseball. And um, for the Saber chapter here in Houston, you're you're the key to this for the past 18 years. And uh, this fall, if I understand it right, you moved to Houston like in 1990 or so. 86. Okay. okay. Didn't know a soul with the Astros. But uh, the Astros, like, through his, you know, personal interest in baseball and his ability to meet people and to get to know people and be a great guy, you know, he's on you know, President Mar chapter with the Astros. He's on their Hall of Fame selection committee. You know, that just shows the kind of guy he is. And I'm pleased to be your friend, Bob, your friend. And so on behalf of the chapter, we got you this gift. Thank you. Thank you. And you can, I think, show it up. Okay. And as soon as I ordered it, I realized, or actually when it came in, I realized how, how large it is. I started thinking about his uh, his study at his house, which is jam full of great baseball things. He's got like seats from the Astrodome. He's got, he's got uh, so many. Christian Rescue. Yeah, um, hopefully, you'll find room for this. Hold out in here. And then it's here. Yeah, bubble wrap. We did well. Um, I will pull it apart later on. Anyway, it says, um, something was right. So, part of what I know is that. That's still a very cool. Very nice. Very nice. Because they had my grandkids out here. Hey, you know what happens? It's like, it. oh, all right. Here we go. Help here. <laughs> No, sorry, we can give help. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay. 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 I've done so many good things, writing books and hosting convention and, and doing a barrage of them. Barrage is that word. I'm kind of halfway speech this week. Thank you for uh, all of you, for all you've done for me in the last 18 years. Go ahead, Joseph. All right. <laughs> Very quickly, um, January 8th. They had the 16th annual Bill Gilbert winter meeting. You know, uh, Tal was a guest speaker. Uh, professional umpire Perry Barber. And Round Rock Express GM Tim Jackson and director of broadcasting Mike Caps. And uh, there was a great presentation from a chapter member, Dan Walsh, talking about the history of baseball through postage stamps. Talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, 
But I, I thought we would kind of start out, and before I introduce our special guest, because I kind of want Piggy to get his thoughts on this too, but um, they do a Hall of Fame vote every year, okay, the whole chapter. And according, and they're pretty accurate as to who actually gets in the Hall of Fame. Because um, as the presentation is, uh, the announcement is what, the 25th? 26th, 25th. 25th, okay. So from the, th and this is directly from them, from the 30 submitted ballots, none of the players reached the 75% threshold to trigger election. Okay, the closest one was David Ortiz was 73.33%. 22 out of 30 people voted. Uh, two other players reached 50%. Clemens with 53.33 and Barry Bonds with 50%. I knew that's the top six were Kirk Schilling, 46.67%, Scott Rowland, and Billy Wagner both had 3%. Two voters opted for none. <laughs> you had to come to be elected to the ballot. So I don't know. We could talk about that later or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I think from, from the latest results that I'm seeing, uh, the latest uh, votes, uh, looks like maybe uh, Big Poppy's the only one that might get it. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, so, uh, so, but without further ado, uh, um, Bill Brown is going to introduce our special guest. But before he does, I would just like to say on a personal note, um, when I was a kid, I didn't have cable. I grew up in the country. Okay? North of town. Y'all know where Conroe is, cut and shoot area. It's where I grew up. All right. Um, I was fortunate at times that the Astros could be on Channel 20. You know, this is the late 70s and into the 80s. But every night during the summer, I would turn on that radio and I would listen to Gene Elston. Later on, when I went for, for the service, came back, it was Milo. Okay. We had a couple of people take over. And that's those guys are really who I how I fell in love with baseball, the radio guys. Okay. Um, I, I went to, I lived in the, the Spokane, Washington, so I listened to the Seattle broadcaster in the 90s. I lived in the Bay Area, I listened to John Miller for a while, and it's really radio, uh, which is how I love baseball, how I fell the way, and then of course it's the great Ben Scully. But our guy tonight, you know, I was a little nervous at first, Bob, <laughs> but, um, his tone and the way he does things, he, he gets so excited. You know, he, he has that catch strength. See you later. See you later. I, I just love that stuff. It, it's the reason I prefer to this day listening to Astros on the radio. I, not to say Bill Brown. <laughs> <laughs> History, don't worry about it. <laughs> but I just love the radio and, and what Bob has done, stepping into some big shoes, so two Hall of Fame guys. And a couple of guys since then. I, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me summers of excitement again, even through all the crap that we've had to deal with. I thought it was your Todd Dallas told me you said you love TV. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I was going to roll. <laughs> but without further ado, Brown. Go. Okay. Well, you've already stolen it. <laughs> What more can I say? But uh, Tal and I, I keep calling Tal every day for about an hour, and he is just totally sick of me right now. But we were talking about uh, when he was growing up in the Boston area, and when he was seven years old, he was captivated by baseball on the radio, and a guy named Jim Britt, Jim Britt, back in those days, was doing the Boston games. He, he did World Series, right, Tal? And, you know, some big national. So it's easier to understand you know, how that could happen in 1940. Things have changed so doggone much. But then kind of kind of bridging the years, uh, when I was in Cincinnati and I was doing TV and we would do, you know, maybe 35 games a year at that point. So radio was still king, very much king. And it was certainly king in Cincinnati. And, you know, when they had Marty Brenneman and Joe Nuxall, and, uh, people just did not, did not watch TV, believe it or not. You know, I had a few people who would come up to me and say, oh, we don't really, we, we have the game on, but we don't listen to you guys because it turns the sound down and listen to radio. And, and that's, you know, it was one of those markets. People were very old fashioned. 
they love the game. If they had a preference, many of them would prefer to sit out on the back patio on a summer night and listen to the radio. <clears throat> and that is certainly a preference that is understandable. Uh, after all, it's the radio broadcaster who teaches you the game when you're young. He explains things to you. He has more time to do this. He's not worrying about replays and, you know, promos. No, there are two promos. Anyway. Uh, but, but it's certainly captivating, and that's the word Tal used to describe how he fell in love with baseball in the ring. Ben Scully uses the, that same terminology. He would actually lie down. And, and if you have the old, uh, no, nobody's as old as I am in this room. Uh, any of you have the old, the big radio sets that were about chest high and, and you know, People would actually lie down on the floor and listen to games on the radio. It's hard to imagine that now, but we did it. And then I'd have my little transistor and I'd have Jack Buck uh, right there near my pillow. And mom would come in and say, are you asleep? Yeah, I'm, I'm close to being asleep, mom. Um, and I think millions of people did this. Uh, it became ingrained. It became something that was a part of your evening or afternoon routine to listen to your guys on the radio. Okay. And they painted the picture for you. And that's what one of the assets, and there are many that Robert has, is the ability to do that. And a radio broadcaster to be in the elite quality and to be a major league everyday broadcaster must be able to paint the picture. That's a talent. That's a talent. And you know, a lot of the descriptiveness is gone in our world today, listening to things on the radio. Uh, but he has it. He has that ability to do it. He came here in 2013, as you know, he'd been in Kansas City. He was a Syracuse guy, so great schooling. And we've talked about that. But but how many people, you know, and so I'm a Mizzou guy, what, whatever the school might be, get this degree, this treasured degree from this great school of journalism. And <laughs> They're, they're not major league broadcasters or they're not network people. And that's not to say they haven't done something maybe even better. Maybe they own the station. I don't know. But uh, there is a lot of competition. He is one of 30 people in the world who does this job for a team every night, play by play. And when you have that mantle attached to you and you've worked so hard your whole life to get it, it becomes a responsibility. He wears that responsibility very well. Uh, I haven't met anybody in broadcasting who works any harder than Robert Ford. And he is just fantastic at every phase of the game. He tells you exactly what's going on, reminds you of the score, tells you man on base, who's batting, where the pitch was. He checks all the boxes that you want from a baseball broadcaster. And he's well on his way to being right up there in the upper echelon for an entire career. He's still too young uh, to want to fast forward to that, but he's definitely on that track. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Ford. Thank you, it's good to be here. Thanks for that introduction, Brownie, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I was thinking about, because Brownie told me he was going to introduce me, and I was thinking about the first time I ever met Bill Brown. And I, I think I've told Brownie this. I remember the date because that's how monumental it was. Not necessarily because of Brown, but the date was December 10th, 2012. That was the day that I interviewed for the Astros radio job. I had worked seven years in the minor leagues for a few different teams calling games. I, at the time, was hadn't finished four years in Kansas City. Uh, working for the Royals flagship station, doing uh, the pregame and postgame shows, uh, you know, getting questions every night on the postgame call and show, like, will the Royals ever win? And the answer was yes when I leave. <laughs> uh, but uh, so um, the Astros job was the first uh, major league play-by-play -play job I ever interviewed for um, and still is the only major league play-by-play -play job I've interviewed for. And um, so the way it all went down um, when I was in Kansas City, you know, I took that job because I felt like even though I wasn't going to be doing play by play of baseball on the radio, 
I felt, well, maybe getting into a major league market and working around a major league team and learning about covering a major league team on a daily basis, um, I felt like that might help me eventually become a play-by-play -play broadcaster. But that was always the goal. Um, and um, I would, uh, you know, you have to submit demos for these jobs. And uh, back in the day, it was a cassette. I'm actually old enough that my first demos when I was getting my only jobs were actually on a cassette. Uh, at this point, they were on a CD. Nowadays, you just email a link to somebody. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I used to uh, sit and watch Royals games. I didn't travel with the team, although I covered all the games. But I was at all the home games in Kansas City at Kauffman Stadium. And I would watch the games from an empty radio booth, which actually is right next to where the visiting radio booth is at Kauffman Stadium. Uh, and I was usually in there by myself, sometimes when somebody else from the radio station would be there. But a uh, handful of times a year, I bring a recorder and do play by play um, into a recorder just so I'd always have demo material, always have a reel, as we like to say, even though no one actually uses reels anymore. Um, and so uh, it was off of that that I um, picked a couple of innings that sounded halfway decent. At least I thought they sounded halfway decent. Um, and when the Astros job was open, I sent them into the Astros. And I remember it was like late November and I was hearing from friends of mine in the business who had also applied for the Astros job that, uh, you know, they were getting rejection letters uh, and I hadn't got one. So I'm like, well, either mine is coming soon or maybe I'm not getting one, who knows? Uh, but I remember uh, getting a phone call in late November from Larry Stokes, who at the time was the head of human resources for the Astros. And he told me, uh, you know, we're uh, interested in talking to you further about the Astros uh, radio broadcast position. Uh, you know, when can we fly you into Houston? Uh, and at that point in my life, I had been in the state of Texas exactly twice. I'd gone to Thanksgiving in Austin once with some family friends and also went to San Antonio on that trip when I was in college. And actually right before I got that phone call, um, at the time I was also doing radio basketball play-by-play -play for Nebraska Omaha and they had played a game at Texas Tech in Lubbock which is the first time I ever saw tumbleweeds in my life uh so I but I I had been to Texas twice in my life had never been to Houston uh so December 10th 2012 um I flew to Houston to interview for the Astros job now December 9th 2012 a couple of things happened that day um one was like I said I was doing basketball games in Nebraska Omaha the night of December 9th, 2012, they played a basketball game at Iowa State up in Ames, which is was living in Kansas City. It was about three, three and a half hour drive. Um, and while I was driving back from doing that game, knowing I have an early morning flight the next day to Houston, interview for a big league job, something I've wanted forever, um, the uh, Kansas City Royals made a trade for James Shields and Wade Davis from Tampa Bay. And I was a Royals reporter, so... Don't text and drive, but I was on my phone, on Twitter, you know, tweeting stuff about the trade as I got one hand on the wheel going down whatever interstate it was in Iowa and through uh, through Missouri, uh, you know, and I remember because I actually went back not too long ago and looked back to see what time those tweets were that I sent. They were like at midnight, 1130 at night after I called this basketball game. And so I got back to. Kansas City in the wee hours of the morning and then had to get up for a thing of like a 7 a.m. flight to Houston the next day. And uh, so, yeah, I go to Minute Maid Park and um, I wound up interviewing with, and some of them were group interviews, some of them were individual, but I wound up interviewing with, a, a, my memory serves, 13 different people. Um, and again, some were groups, some were not. Um, but the first interview I was in was with Larry Stokes, uh, the head of HR, and Bill Brown. Um, and I knew who Brownie was because I, you know, I, it was a student of broadcasting, and, you know, and been, you know, been the baseball fan my whole life and always paid attention to the broadcasts. Uh, so I knew who Brownie was and I knew he'd been in Houston for a long time. And um, yeah, and I just remember Brownie was so intimidating because I, I mean, Brownie may have asked like one or two questions, but he was like, he, he, has a, he, had a, he was like, it felt like he was staring a hole through me. Like just kind of looking at me over his glasses while I spoke, like, know about this guy. Um, so it's kind of funny to think back to that, um, to that initial meeting. And, you know, now, you know, Brownie's become a good friend and has become a mentor as well. And, you know, I'm privileged to say that, 
you know, we were able to work together, um, you know, on the Astros broadcast at the same time, obviously grounding on TV and me on radio. And we actually did do a few uh, spring training games together, if memory serves. So, and we've done some radio games during the regular season together as well. So, but yeah, that was the first time I met Browning. Uh, and that day, yeah, that day was a whirlwind. Um, yes, I interviewed with uh, Jim Crane that day in his office. And that was more, um, Jim basically was telling me about his vision for the team. And, you know, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to try and get prospects and build up the farm system. And, you know, it was more Jim selling me on Jim and on the Astros. Uh, whereas, you know, I mean, I was going to, if they offered me the job, I was going to take it no matter what. I like, was <laughs> like, wait, how many games are you going to win next year? Uh, that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't a good start. Um, George Pistolos, who was the team president at the time, that was another interview. Yeah, it was, um, it was an absolute whirlwind. But there are two people who are responsible for me being in Houston. So these are the people who deserve the credit or the blame, depending on their point of view. Um, one of them was one of the people that I interviewed with that day. His name's Brian Erickson, and he still is the, uh, uh, head of AM programming for what was then Clear Channel, now iHeartMedia, which is basically in Houston, is you know, 790, you know, which KBME, which our games are on, and 740 KTRH, which, of course, the Astros were on forever and still are on occasion. <laughs> so Brian Erickson's in charge of those two stations uh, here in Houston. And he was one of the people who filtered through the demo CDs that the Astros got for their radio opening. And he listened to mine. He uh, told the Astros, you need to hire this guy. Um, and I remember when I interviewed with him that day, December 10th, 2012, he was basically like, you can relax. I think you should have a job. Uh, don't worry. You, you know, I think you sound great. Um, how are you doing? Tell me more. <laughs> it, was, it was super laid back. Uh, uh, so he was so Brian was the one who kind of picked my CD out of the pile. And then the Astros were responsible for being in Houston with the Astros is Jim Crane. Uh, because what wound up happening was there were that day several other people interviewed. Um, Jeff Blum interviewed that day. Steve Sparks interviewed that day. Actually, Sparks had already, I think he had already interviewed um, at that point. But they interviewed some, you know, few people that day, as I'm sure Brownie may, may or may not remember. Um, and um, it came down to for the radio play by play job, it came down to me and another broadcaster with a lot more experience. We've been with a few different teams. Um, and um, most of the executive team, the people who had to, sat through the interviews, and listened to the demos and what have you, they wanted to hire the more experienced broadcaster. And I hadn't done any Major League Baseball play-by-play. -play. Um, and Jim Crane, uh, it's like, well, what's wrong with Remember Ford? So I guess they had this meeting after the meeting. Um, and Brian Erickson's the one who's told me this, by the way, which is how I know this. So after that meeting, Jim Crane calls Brian Erickson and says, tell me why you like Robert Ford. So he told him. And uh, and Jim said to him, well, I think I'm going to hire him. And if this doesn't work out, work out, I'm blaming you. And I started laughing. And Jim Crane goes, I'm not kidding. Uh, so, I mean, it's been 10 years now. So I guess it's, it's going to be my 10th year this in 2022 so i guess it's worked out okay um but yeah those are the two people responsible for me most responsible for me even coming to houston and getting the astros job um and uh but yeah it was and then this was i got hired uh in february and it was uh the day before valentine's day 2013 when they announced Myself and Steve Sparks as the new broadcast team for the Astros. We met roughly five minutes before they announced us as the new radio broadcast team for the Astros. We hadn't known each other at all. Um, and that's wound up being a great partnership and a great marriage, really, um, you know, between the two of us. But yeah, they had no idea what they were what they were going to get when they put the two of us together because we had never worked together um, and didn't know each other at all. Uh, but um, yeah, that day... Uh, you know, we get introduced and then maybe a week later, I'm driving from Kansas City to Houston and then flying to Kissimmee, Florida, where the Astros had spring training at the time, you know, calling spring training games for a team that I'd never seen before and a team that was had a lot of players most people hadn't heard of and a team that was had a new manager, Bo Porter, 
who decided that he wasn't going to have last names on the back of spring training jerseys because, according to Bo, these guys need to earn the name on the back. So all he did was make my job harder. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, and, you know, that first year, obviously, in 2013, as I'm sure uh, pretty much everyone in this room knows, was not a banner year for the Astros. As a matter of fact, it was the exact opposite. The Astros losing 111 games and setting a franchise record. Um, and, but even still, I knew that, you know, this is where I wanted to be. And I was still happy to be in the big leagues. It probably helped that the Astros lost 111 games my first year in the big leagues, um, as opposed to later on in my career. And hopefully, you know, that never happens again. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still a joy to call big league baseball and to call baseball in general. And I think one thing that really helped me, especially those first couple of years, when the Astros weren't very good was my first year broadcasting baseball was in 2002 in Yakima, Washington for the Yakima bears drew an Arizona Diamondbacks affiliate in the Northwest league, which was a short season league. We played 76 games in 80 days. Um, I got that job at the winter meetings, which were in Boston in December of 2011 or I'm sorry, December of 2001. And uh, got hired at the winter meetings with a demo tape I made. And this was actually a set back in 2001 of games I called from the stands at Yankee Stadium and Chase Stadium. Uh, that was the first uh, demo tape that I actually submitted of baseball to anyone uh, was my calls of Mets and Yankees games. And most of the tape was my call of the uh, Yankees Red Sox game uh, that I call from the stands. And, but the first clip on the tape was my call. If you remember the uh, first baseball game played in New York city after nine 11 was between the Mets and the Braves. And at the time the Mets were trying to fight in the playoffs and would wind up coming up short that year. It was Mets and the Braves and the Mets were trailing late and Mike Piazza hit a go ahead uh, two run home run off for sure. Steve Parse to put the Mets ahead for good. And he wanted one yeah. that game and the first game baseball game in New York after nine 11. Well, my first call on my first demo was my call of that home run hit by Mike Piazza from the stands at Chase Stadium. Uh, and so, yeah, so I went out to uh, Yakima, Washington, I had never been to the West Coast before, um, drove cross country and uh, with a car I had bought a month before and uh, went out to Yakima, Washington, and they were a Diamondbacks affiliate. And the Diamondbacks had an interesting strategy that year. And I don't know if this was what they planned, but basically their strategy was we're not going to send any of our high draft picks to Yakima, Washington. Um, or if they were there, they were there very briefly. So... Needless to say, the Yakima Bears in 2002 were not very good. As a matter of fact, they had a 22-game losing streak, which has only been done by two other minor league teams in the last 40 years. I lose 22 in a row. Um, and when you play a seven, I mean, 22-game losing streak is pretty bad anyway, but especially when you play a 76-game season, I mean, that's just a 30-year season right there. Um, but yeah, they did, win a, they did not win a game in the month of August, the 2002 Yakima Bears. Um, so, uh, but even still, you know, that year in 2002, um, I was just trying to figure out, like, if I wanted to do this and if I was any good at it. Um, you had a question, sir? Well, you said you called it from the stand. You just up there with the mic? Calling with the tech recorder and the microphone, yeah. Not working for anybody. You're nope. Just yeah. Hanging out, calling the game. Just calling a game. That's just like a, like a normal person would do with a baseball. That's a bad <laughs> Okay. You know what's funny that you bring that up. So the Yankees Red Sox game, let I call from the stands in 2001. If it wasn't a sellout, it was pretty close. Um, Pedro Martinez started for the for the Red Sox, who was actually my all time favorite pitcher to watch. I used to I saw him pitch at Yankee Stadium when he was with Boston at least six or seven times. I would kind of plan out like I you know look ahead like a week ahead, two weeks ahead to see if he was going to pitch at Yankee Stadium because I grew up a Mets fan actually in the Bronx as a Mets fan, believe it or not. Uh, so 1986, I had different feelings about it than a lot of people in this room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, yeah, that, so this game was packed. So I'm in the upper deck at Yankee Stadium with my tape recorder. I have my scorebook on one leg. I have some notes on my other leg. And um, yeah, I'm calling the game from the stands. And I'm, I'm you know, it's elbow to elbow people. 
And uh, wound up being a good game. Andy Ramirez hit a home run off of Mariano Rivera in the ninth to tie it. And then the Yankees wound up winning it on a Luis Soho walk-off hit in the bottom of the ninth off of Rod Beck. Those names bring back some memories for baseball fans. Um, but uh, I remember at one point, and I didn't realize this until I listened back to the demo much later, I said something. It was a big moment in the game. And I mentioned, you know, the crowd's really getting loud. And when I listened back to my demo, there was someone in the stand saying, he said we're getting loud. Let's get loud. <laughs> These people inadvertently were actually helping me. <laughs> with my demo. But so, yeah, so I get out to Yakima in 2002. And um, yeah, so I was trying to figure out whether I could do this and whether I wanted to do this. Um, and by the end of the summer, I knew that I did want to do this. And I felt like if I kept working at it, I could be halfway decent at it. Um, but I think it was probably really helpful to me to have to broadcast a team that wasn't very good my first year, because I think, you know, it's a lot easier to enjoy something or to enjoy broadcasting for a team when everything's going well, when the team's winning and everybody's great and everybody's in a great mood. Um, it's a little harder when the team's not as good. Uh, and I mean, we had a really good staff. They were all really good guys. Our manager was Mike Aldretti, who now coaches for Oakland, and played in the big leagues. Our pitching coach was Mel Stottlemyre Jr., who's a big league pitching coach with a few teams. I think he's with Miami now. I mean, our hitting coach was Jay Gaynor, who played a little bit in the big leagues and kind of lived in the area. Uh, it was an original Colorado Rocky in 93. Um, they were all great guys to me and uh, great to deal with. And that made it a lot easier. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, having to go through that and still, you know, every day enjoying going to the ballpark despite, you know, cause I mean, and Brownie knows this as well. You, there are years when you're broadcasting for a team and you go to the ballpark thinking, yeah, we probably don't have much of a chance tonight because, you know, the team's not very good or you, you got a really good pitcher going against you or whatever. I mean, you never know what can happen obviously, but there are days when you go to the ballpark and you figure they're probably going to call a loss. Um, and even still with that, I still enjoy every single day of being in Yakima, Washington, uh, and throughout the Pacific Northwest calling uh, minor league baseball. And for a team that wasn't very good, it was still a blast. I still enjoyed every minute of it. Um, it was a great summer. Um, there's still people that I keep in touch with that I met when I was in Yakima. Um, so that's kind of how it all kind of started. So I think that was good preparation that year in Yakima for you know, so 2013 with the Astros when they lost 111 games um, and, you know, weren't, weren't very good. And it was more about selling the future and selling hope than it was about necessarily talking about, you know, how good the, the 2013, um, you know, Astros club were because they, they were not. There were a lot of good guys in that team, just not a lot of good baseball players. Yes. What would you estimate your listening audience was in Yakima, Washington? That's a good question. Um, I know. So this was in the very, this was, this was when being able to listen to games on the internet was in its infancy pretty much. And when minor league teams started doing this in 2002. Um, and so a lot of the parents would listen. Uh, that's the interesting thing about being in the minors is, you know, I was with three different teams in the minor leagues. Um, you know, I was in Yakima for a year and then I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, called games for an independent league team in frontier league for two years, then in Binghamton, New York, calling games with Mets AA affiliate for four years. And so often, and this is an exaggeration, so often when parents come to see their sons play, the first person they want to meet in the minors is the radio guy, because that's the one who's been bringing their kids games to them, uh, you know, this whole time. Uh, I forget, we had, I'll get back to Yakima here in a second, but when I was in Binghamton, my first year, 2005, uh, our best pitcher on the team was Brian Bannister, one of pitching in the big leagues, and he's now a pitching coach and one of the one of my favorite people all time that I've been around in baseball. And Brian's dad was Floyd Bannister, who pitched in the big leagues. Actually, was you know pitched briefly for the Astros. Um, and I had asked Brian when his parents were going to come to town because I wanted to meet his dad and I wanted to interview Floyd Bannister. And uh, and I remember Brian had told me and I had forgotten. But I'm about to go on the air in Binghamton, and I get a knock on the door of my radio booth, and I open the door, and there's this guy comes up to me, and he, he says, you're Robert Ford, right? Floyd Bannister, nice to meet you. I love listening to you. Thank you so much. And like I should, and I, it was like a whirlwind. It was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
are you free tomorrow? Can I, can I talk to you later? And I mean, he, he, we wound up being great, but yeah, that happens a lot in the minors. So yeah, a lot of families were listening for sure. Um, there were definitely people in the community who listened in Yakima, uh, but a funny story about that year. So this is 2002. Yakima is about three hours from Seattle. And this is when the Mariners were really good and extremely popular in this part of the country. Uh, and uh, bless you. And uh, I noticed that there were fans in the stands who would have headsets on and listening to a, a radio broadcast. And so I thought they were listening to me. And I made mention to one of the season ticket holders, man, it's great that people come to the games and listen to me. And the season ticket holder looked at me and was like, they're not listening to you. They're listening to the Mariners. They're listening to, to J.P. House and Rick Viz. And so that was, that was one of the many very humbling moments of my podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they were, they, were, they were not listening to me in the stands. At least not most of those people. But we were on a uh, AM station that was a classic country station. And now I'm from New York City where, you know, no one knows anything about country music. Uh, like, I, I, I didn't grow up listening to it. Um, there's not even a country music. There, there, I don't think there's, there hasn't been a country music radio station in New York City probably in 40, 50 years. It just doesn't, it just doesn't rain. So I go to Yakima and find out not only are our games on a country station, but a classic country station. I had no idea what that meant. Um, and, uh, but the people who worked there were, were fantastic and, and free to deal with. Uh, but yeah, that was an experience. And then every now and again, because they would pipe the uh, audio and broadcast into the concourse at the ballpark. So after games, sometimes we, you know, me and the other staff members, we'd be hanging out in the concourse, whatever, having a beer or what have you, and they're eating some leftover hot dogs or something. And we'd have the radio still on to the classic country station after the game was over. And we'd be sitting there and we were all, you know, most of the staffers were pretty young, were around my age. I was 23 at the time. And uh, we'd, be, we'd be like, what are we listening to right now? What is this? Can somebody turn that off, please. Uh, but needless to say, we were not the classic country audience uh, at, the, at the time. Yes. Did you ever find yourself in one of those games that's just like it's never going to end? Yeah. It's going off into a Harry Doyle. Never did that. Never drank on the air, not alcohol, anything. Um, yeah, you always, I mean, you're always going to have a game or two like that in the season um, where it just seems like it won't end. Or the worst, actually, are the games where you have a long rain delay beforehand, which is one of the great things about working in Houston with a roof um, and working in the AL West where we do most of the games where everybody either has a roof now or it doesn't rain um, if they are out uh, but yeah, the worst are really the games that drag when you've already had, you know, a rain delay at the start and then maybe a rain delay in the middle of it. Uh, those are the ones that make you maybe consider a different career or those days. Um, I remember uh, I did a game in Binghamton, New York, and it was early in the season. It was April and it was very cold. It was probably 40 degrees. Um and I had lost my voice, which, you know, is something that happens from time to time. And I was working solo in Binghamton. And the game went 15 innings. And um, I remember, this, this is not someone who went to the big leagues. We had this outfielder, Binghamton, Jorge Padilla. He hit a law off and run in the bottom of the fifth. And I was so excited, not only because the game had ended, but I could finally stop talking. Uh and uh, so I call the home run and I try to, you know, like, you know, you try to raise your voice an octave and my voice cracked because that's how that's how badly worse I was at the time. Uh, and it was freezing in Binghamton. Um, but, yeah, you do have games like that from time to time. I remember one year also in Binghamton, we had a game in Trenton, New Jersey, where we had a long rain delay. And it was on my birthday, too. Uh, had a rain, had a long rain delay. And then the game on going 15 innings. And then we had to get on a bus and go to New Britain, Connecticut after the game. So we didn't get into New Britain, Connecticut until about nine in the morning uh, after, uh, after that game. But, you know, for the longest time, um, I never did a game longer than 15 innings. And the reason I knew, know that is because the scorebook that I use goes to 15 innings. Um, and that changed in 2016. Um, I believe, yeah, it was 2016. Astros hosted Cleveland. 
and they played a game that went 16 innings, and Marwin Gonzalez won it on a walk-off homer. Um, that was the first time I actually had to flip to a new page of my scorebook to put in a 16th inning on the page. Unfortunately, the inning or the game didn't last much longer than that. So I still hate the ghost run, by the way, just in case you're wondering. But uh, fortunately, there aren't too many games like that over the course of the season. But yeah, you'll have a few where, you know, they're just dragging or it's really hot. You know, it's like every no one can throw a strike. And yeah, those, you know, like I remember telling AJ Hench once when he was managing here, because um, he, he said to me something like, uh, uh, we were talking about some game or something, and he was like, yeah, he was like, that was dragging or something like that. I was like, yeah, I said, I really felt it upstairs. He's like, you can feel that? I said, I'm like, AJ, if you think the game is dragging, I think the game is dragging. <laughs> I said, I'm not, you know, um, maybe in the elements quite the way you are, but yeah, I'm like, if you if you feel it, we feel it too. Maybe not in the same way, because we don't get paid for, win, for winning or losing, but um, we definitely feel it. So, yeah. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Do you still have your cassette deck um, tapes? Uh, the, like the demos? Yes. I still have, I think I still have a couple of the, of my original demo. And like, I got, I even printed out um, labels to put on the tape of like my name and address, phone number for teams to contact me. But yeah, I still have, remember I made 50 of them and I think I gave out like five. Um, had my dual cassette tape deck that I could, you know, record. And I was, I spent like all day one day doing that right before the winter meetings. Um, CDs are much better, as are emailing links to people uh, of audio. So, yes. So what's the key to your relationship with Sparks? I mean, it's not like in the minors where you're working a lot of games by yourself, and now you've got a partner that you've never worked with. What's the key to getting that successful? That's a good question. And it was an adjustment for me learning how to work with a partner, because I have had interns that I've worked with, but that's a lot different than working with a pro, you know, former major league ball player. Um, is just going to have you know more knowledge and expertise than your average intern in the minor leagues that you're doing games with. Right. Um, and I think the part of, I think what makes it work with with Steve and I, I think there are a couple of things. So for, first of all, we're both big baseball fans. Um, and you know you'd be surprised there are quite a few players who I mean they may love playing baseball, but they're not necessarily baseball fans. Like Steve Sparks, Steve Sparks had never played at all, had never thrown a pitch in the minors or the majors, Steve Sparks would still be the biggest baseball fan, for sure. Because, I mean, he grew up, you are talking about the transistor radio, he grew up with that and, you know, listening to games and, you know, absolutely was, you know, collected baseball cards as a kid. I mean, so first of all, he's, he's we're both big baseball fans. Um, I think another part of it is neither one of us have massive egos. Um, so, you know, we don't care who shines or who gets credit or who does what, uh, that's not a big deal to either of us. Um, so I think that's important. And I think the other thing is uh, we both take what we do very seriously and, and take our preparation very seriously without taking ourselves too seriously. And that goes back to not having, you know, huge egos as well. And I think that's, you know, I think those are probably the biggest reasons why, you know, that partnership works and, you know, we enjoy being around each other and we, you know, at this point, I mean, we've been together nine years. We can play off of each other. Um, so that that just makes it that much more enjoyable. Um, but, yeah, I think those are the, the three biggest things. Yes? Kind of follow-up on that. I work with both you and Steve a lot. Uh, Steve does some play-by-play, and you can hear, I don't know, is that part of his contract? Or, and also so the – it's not specific, it's explicitly part of Steve's contract. So. Those of you, and I'm sure most of you in this room remember when, you know, Milo Hamilton was calling games on the radio and most of his broadcast partners were former players, whether it was, you know, Larry Durker or Alan Ashby. Um, and they would always do, wherever the uh, former player in the booth with Milo would always do two innings of play by play. They'd always do, I believe it was the fourth inning and the seventh inning. Um, and so when I got hired, uh, I had no idea, and neither did Steve, for that matter. We had no idea what the division of labor was going to be. We had no idea, uh, was I going to do all the play-by-play? -play? Was Steve going to do some play-by-play? -play? And I remember telling Steve um, at the beginning of our first spring training, I asked him, like, do you want to do play-by-play? -play? He was, I was like, have they told you you're doing any play-by-play? -play? He was like, 
It's like, they haven't told me anything. It's like, I'll do it if they ask me to. And I just told him, I said, hey, just know I will never stand in the way of you doing play-by-play. I said, I want to do the majority of the innings of play-by-play, but I will never stand in the way of you doing play-by-play if this is something you want to do. Uh, and Milo actually came down. That was actually the last spring training uh, that Milo uh, came to uh, in 2013 in Kissimmee. And uh, he filled in for me for a couple of games and filled in for Sparks for a couple of games. And a couple of games, excuse me, a couple of games he did with Sparks, he had him do play-by-play for the first time. And so that's kind of how that got the ball rolling with Steve doing play-by-play. Um, you know, after a few years, when Reed Ryan was team president, he said, well, how about Steve do a third inning of play-by-play? So then it became third, fourth, and seventh. Um, and, I mean, I, I like it um, because – I think it's helpful for us to switch roles because it gives us a little bit of a different perspective. I think it gives the audience a little bit of a different perspective. Um, you know, if it was one of those things where they asked me to do all nine, I would, but I definitely prefer this. Um, and I think it also kind of gives me a little bit of a break, a little bit of a breather, which I really realized when um, Steve uh, got COVID and I wound up missing an entire West Coast road trip. And I had to do most of those, or pretty much all those games by myself. I really appreciated Steve after that, <laughs> um, as if I didn't already. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a good change of pace. Um, and I, I think Steve, is, he's developed into a really good play-by-play broadcaster as well. Yes. Your choice, your most precious asset. How do you take that during the season and in the off season? Nothing. It's pretty much exhausted. See, well, I do a lot of yelling. Um, no, I, actually, not at all. Uh, that's like the worst thing. You, um, you know, it's funny. I get that question a lot. I don't necessarily do anything special, and I think that's probably true for most broadcasters. I think more of it is just not doing anything ridiculous. Like, you know, don't frequent, you know, loud clubs where you have to yell to talk to the person next to you, for instance. Uh, that was never my scene anyway, so I guess it's the right job for me. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, not overexerting yourself, you know, your voice when you don't have to, not yelling. And also, too, on the air, that's another big part of it, too, um, because I think a lot of young broadcasters who are just starting out, and I certainly did this, when they get excited, they yell. Um, and that's not what you want to do, and that generally doesn't sound as good. What you want to do more is just kind of raise your voice, like come up a few octaves. And that takes time to, to kind of learn uh, as a broadcaster. Um, so because I remember the first few times I ever did play by play when I was in college, you know, after the games were over, I'd, I'd feel hoarse. Um, but you that means when that happens, that means you're not using your voice correctly. Um, and so over time, I, I learned that um, I probably should drink tea more often. I do drink tea. Chamomile is the best tea for your voice, by the way. Like, especially like if you ever have like a, like your horse or whatever, some chamomile with some honey, that works better than anything else uh, as far as tea goes. So, fun fact. Yes. Do you sing for voice control? Good. You don't want me to sing. Nobody does. Um, uh, no, I don't, I don't sing. I know there's some broadcasts who do like vocal exercises and stuff like that. Um, I've never really done anything specific like that, but. Uh, I think I think it definitely can help. Yes. So um, I go back to the Gene Elston days here, um, and I was he was the guy that I listened to in my bed, and my my mom would come in and say you were you were asleep, I wouldn't catch you. <laughs> but so I, I kind of grew up with him, and never, never heard any of his calls. He's very cool, calm, mm-hmm. collected, and the opposite of a home. We yeah, had a few homers. You know. In our in the past, those smartcast issues, in my opinion. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you, you come across to, to me as, as someone that's very Gene Elston like. I don't know if you like him, but mm-hmm. your approach to it, which I really, really like, and I was really picky about about the guys <laughs> that you can play by play. I really am. I really like what you do and the way you do it. But the, my question is that, that background did you have any sort of guidance given you or? Any training that, 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 that talked about the Homer factor, if you will, and how much to do and how much not to do? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily any formal training. So for me, like I grew up in New York City. I was a huge Mets fan. Daryl Strawberry is still my all-time favorite player. He had a walk-off home run first Mets game I ever went to. Uh, 
in April of 1985 off the Reg John Franco, by the way. Um, and I've actually found the video of that on YouTube. Um, so when I really start to get into um, following baseball every day, because uh, I grew up a Mets fan, I'm from a family of Mets fans. And it wasn't until the late 80s when I really started to really like make an effort to follow baseball on a regular basis uh, and follow the Mets every day. Um, and back in those days, in the late 80s into the 90s, the Mets had 75 games on WWR Channel 9 over the air, and they had 75 games on what was then Sports Channel on cable. And my mom did not get cable. My parents were divorced. My be my dad's on weekends. He had cable, but the Mets usually were on Channel Nine. Yes. Uh, but so during the week, uh, I listened to a lot of the Mets games on the radio. And the Mets broadcasters when I was growing up were Bob Murphy and Gary Cohen. And Bob Murphy uh, called Mets games from day one in 1962. Um, and Gary Cohen was like the young guy in the booth. Uh, when I started listening to Mets on the radio, Gary was maybe a year or two out of the minor leagues. Um, and you know, now he does the Mets television broadcast on on uh, on their cable network on S and Y and does a really great job. Uh, but I grew up listening to those two guys. Um, and neither of them are homers, classified as homers. They certainly wanted the Mets to win. They certainly um, get excited, more excited when the Mets do something well, as opposed to when another team does something against the Mets. Um, but they also were very prepared, especially Gary, in terms of like knowledge of the other teams and the other players and background and information like that. And I get a lot of that from having listened to, to Gary Cohen all those years. And after Bob Murphy retired, Gary Cohen became a lead radio play by play guy. Um, and he's probably the one. I mean, he's definitely the biggest baseball broadcasting influence for me. Um, so I don't know if there was anything I necessarily learned. I think it just came more from that's what you guys um, it, that uh, I want to stop anybody from getting their money. Um, <laughs> that I think that's, you know, it was like just kind of through osmosis. Because I think you grow up when you become a broadcaster, I think, at least especially starting out, you, you try to sound like the people you grew up listening to. Um, and then hopefully you eventually develop your own style. But I think that's where that really comes from. Um, and I honestly think early in my minor league career, I tried too hard to be kind of neutral and to not be too much of a home. Um, and it took time for me to kind of learn, yeah, it's okay to be more excited when your team does something well. And you can still be excited when the other team makes a great play or, you know, what have you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it was more just kind of learning just from listening and you know, what my influences were growing up. Thank you. Yeah. What is it about Syracuse that so many big time announcers came from Syracuse? Because it's really cold and snowy. And so you have nothing better to do but to stay inside and work on at your school. And that's not it. We still find ways to get out. Um, as a matter of fact, depending on whatever study or you look at, Syracuse is one of the top party schools in the Northeast. Um, I think for at Syracuse, you know, I mean, um, I didn't realize I wanted to do uh, play by play uh, until I got to Syracuse. I initially thought, well, maybe I want to be a sports anchor, a sports reporter, or what have you. And my dad was actually the one that he had planted the seed even before I ever knew I wanted to do this. I remember him mentioning to me when I was a kid about how, uh, you know, Bob Costas went to Syracuse, and that's where a lot of the uh, sports broadcasters go. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a school where a lot of them come out of, I don't know how my dad knew this. Uh, my dad, I'd be proud to tell you, he was a junior college dropout, but, uh, he was very well aware of, uh, Syracuse's reputation. So that seed was kind of planted early, even before I knew I wanted to do this. So, uh, you know, when I started looking at colleges and realized I wanted to study broadcast journalism, Syracuse, and also too, I didn't want to go super far from home. I wanted to go away, but I didn't want to go too far away. Um, Syracuse is about four or five hours from New York City. Um, so that was perfect. Uh, a lot of people think it's a suburb of New York City, but it's not. But it's very different, which I learned when I got there. I thought it was a suburb too, honestly, because I had never been there before. Um, I started looking at schools. But um, I think they're, you know, first of all, it's a really good program. 
Um, you get a lot of hands-on experience. Uh, there are three radio stations on campus. The best known one is uh, WAER, which is a student station, uh, the NPR station on campus, and they also play jazz, and they also have student broadcast of all the Syracuse men's basketball, football, and men's lacrosse games. The cross is huge in Syracuse, at Syracuse, by the way. Um, and uh, so, and I actually never worked for WAR, but I still, there were still other stations there that I did work for. And I worked for commercial radio stations in town as well. So there are a lot of opportunities to get on the air there, whether it's on campus or in the community. Um, I think another thing that's great because, and this isn't just with broadcasting, but a lot of schools, um, when you're applying to schools, they'll tell you about, you know, all the great alums that have come from this program or from your university. Um, and then you go and you hear about them, but you never see them. But one of the great things about going to Syracuse is all the famous alums, they all come back. I got to meet Marv Albert. He came and spoke when I was there. Uh, Mike Tirico spoke several times. Uh, Dick Stockton was uh, doing NBA games on, on uh, Turner at the time. He came and spoke, another Syracuse alum. Andy Musser uh, was uh, Philly's radio broadcaster. He came and spoke. This is the first time I ever saw a World Series ring, actually. It was Andy Muster's 1980 Phillies uh, championship ring. Um, and now the one I have is bigger. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Bob Costas, he came and spoke when I was a student there. Um, so it's not just that, well, hey, Syracuse has produced all of these great alums. And it's not just in sports broadcasting, it's in broadcasting in general. But like they come back and speak. And actually, I'm actually going to be in Syracuse um, the last weekend of the month. So I guess what, not this weekend, but the following weekend. Because uh, I try to go up every few years to go to a basketball game. Um, and they've renovated the Carrier Dome and I want to see it, um, even though Syracuse basketball is not worth watching this year. Um, and uh, whenever I go up, I always reach out to um, actually one of my former classmates who kind of runs their sports media center uh, at Syracuse. And, uh, you know, I say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to be up, be in town. And you know, if you want me to speak to students, I'll speak to students. And when I tell them that, all of a sudden I get great seats to the basketball game. <laughs> so, you know, it works out for everyone. Uh, so I'm going to have really good seats to the Syracuse basketball game. Book or two, and I'll speak to students while I'm up there. And I've done it, done that a couple of times. Um, talk to students. Um, and uh, it's kind of surreal, actually. Like the first time I did it, it was like, wait, I was always in these rooms. I remember being a student sitting in these rooms listening to, you know, Sean McDonough or whomever. Um, and actually be the one students were listening to was actually pretty cool and a lot of fun. So, and I think it's important too to like pay it forward. And that's the cool thing about meeting those broadcasters is that they all kind of felt that way too, which is why they were talking to us. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I have friends who got jobs because, you know, they met, they got to meet Bob Costas when he was on campus or Mike Tirico. I mean, that, you know, that makes a difference. Yes. I've heard Yankee radio. You do not sound like a person from the Bronx like they did. <laughs> well, Susan Walden is from Boston. Well, they have definitely have a regional, whether they have a it regional accent. Regional you don't have a regional accent. It like comes that. out in a certain word. It comes out more when I'm in New York and ordering pizza. Um, and and you uh, work on purposely or just I, you know what's funny so um both of my parents were also born and raised in new york city uh, and my mom doesn't have much of an accent and she's lived in new york city her entire life uh, my dad had more of an accent not like you know d's and does but it was certainly there um but yeah i mean it's just not it's just was never something that was particularly strong um but yeah i have been told when i talk to my mom on the phone my accent comes out more. Um, and I definitely feel that like if I'm <laughs> like, yeah, like I said, if I'm like ordering pizza or I'm at a bar or something and, you know, the bartender or whomever, or the server like is from New York and has an accent, I find myself kind of falling back into it a little bit, if you will. Uh, but if like the bartender or whomever I can clearly tell is not from New York, then I don't do it. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, but I've never really had a strong accent and I couldn't Really couldn't tell you why. That's just the way it's it's kind of worked out. Probably wouldn't have got this job if you sound like you're from Bronx. Well, you know, Eric Nadell, who's Hall of Fame broadcaster with the Rangers. If you've ever listened to Eric Nadell on the radio, he sounds like he just came from Brooklyn, which is where he's from. And he's great. Like I and he's he's one of my good friends in the business. Uh, but yeah, he still very much has a, a very strong Brooklyn accent. Yeah. 
Yes. When you have such a recognizable slogan call, is that something you consciously figure out? Well, I, I have to have something that I can identify with. So it identifies me. I mean, do you work on that? I try to in the minors, and it doesn't work out well when you do it that way. When you try, when it's contrived, uh, you know. And I've had people ask me, like, you know, to see you later, like, where did that come from? And I honestly can't tell you, like, when it started or that it was a conscious thing. It was just something I would say on home runs, and I like the way it sounded, so I'd say it more often uh, when the Astros hit a home run. And those who listen, you know, somewhat regularly know that I don't always say "see you later" on every home run. It just just kind of just depends on the home run and just kind of what kind of just comes to mind. Um, and I've always been some broadcasters try to script things out more. Um, and I've always been someone who uh, feels like I sound best when it's spontaneous and when it's extemporaneous and I'm not trying to write anything down. And I also hate reading from a script. I absolutely hate it. Um, so like, even if I like, uh, you know, like if I'm, you know, giving a speech and I have notes, it'll just be like bullet points. It will never be like completely written out because I don't, that's just not the way my brain works. Um, but yeah, it's something that, yeah, when I first started in the minor leagues, I thought, yeah, you know, you need to have the signature home run call and I would try out different things and they were terrible um, because it was forced. But yeah, this just kind of developed. And I don't know that I said see you later when I was in the minors. I honestly can't remember, but I don't think I did. But it was something I said a few times and thought it sounded pretty good. And it's like, well, let me keep doing that. So, and I think that's honestly how a lot of the best calls develop. Yes. Well, yeah. So um, you said you don't like to use a script. And I'm thinking of two calls in particular. Taking away the 2017 World Series champs call. Mm -hmm. um, how did you sort of troll yourself when Altuve hit the home run off of Chapman in 2019? Was that something? Well, you could argue that I didn't control myself. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's right there. So, it's not like um, you had to be overwhelmed or something. Uh, oh, and uh, in 19 at the, the ALCS. I mean... You know, and that's kind of the cool thing, too. And I think that's also the reason why, um, especially when you talk about postseason, um, you don't want to script anything. I remember something that uh, Pat Hughes, uh, the longtime Cubs radio broadcaster, uh, said in 2016 when the Cubs went to the World Series and people were asking him, yeah, the Cubs haven't won since 1908. What are you going to say when the Cubs win? What's going to be your call? Pat, Pat's answer was, I don't know. It's like it depends on what happens. Maybe it's a walk-off home run. Maybe it's an exciting play at the plate. Maybe it's just a whole hum fly ball to right field. And, and you know, the, the final score is 10 to 2. It's like you don't say like you can't plan something when you don't even know what the how the game is going to go. Um, so my call for the end of the 2019 ALCS was a lot different than my call for the end of the 2021 ALCS, which is just a harmless fly ball. You know, it was caught and, you know, and I mean, the game wasn't really in doubt at that point and that was it. Whereas, you know, with um, Altuve, with the home run, uh, you know, it was, and I mean, that was, as I'm sure most people in this room remember, I mean, you know, the Astros had the lead going into the ninth inning. DJ LeMahieu hits the home run to tie it. Uh, so that was kind of deflating. Um, so it looked like, okay, they were going to go to the World Series and now not quite when we thought. And then you get to the bottom of the ninth and I remember Chapman, you know, first two hitters, I mean, he just was dominant and, you know, got two quick outs. And then George Springer came up and all of a sudden couldn't throw a strike with his fastball. And Springer realized that and drew a walk. And so, you know, and I remember thinking, you know, when Altuve came up and Chapman was still spraying his fastball, still couldn't throw it for a strike. Um, I remember thinking, is it got, if I remember correctly, it got to three and two or three and one. And uh, so, but I think Steve and I even talked about it on the air. Like Altuve has to be sitting slider here. There's no reason to look for anything else because he can't throw anything else for a strike and you're ahead in the count. So if he throws a fastball for a strike, just tip your hat. But yeah, I mean, do you, I mean, but yeah, did I know he was going to hit a home run there? No. Um, so you don't, you can't plan that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just kind of let the emotion just kind of take over. Um, and I think it's important to do that and also still, and this goes back to not yelling when you're on the air, let the emotion kind of take over. Uh, whatever that emotion is, and still you still want to be clear enough so that people understand what what's going on, because um, uh, you know there's nothing worse. I remember years ago listening to uh, a high school football game, and uh, when I was in Michigan, and it was a tie game, 
and time was, you know, it was like, you know, second or two left on the clock. And the kicker was lining up for a field goal. And the broadcaster was like, you know, the kick is up. And oh, so that, oh, so, oh, and he missed, or oh, it's good. Like, like that. And they just started screaming. He had, it was like, wait, wait. And it took like maybe like a minute before they actually said the kick was good. And it's like, well, this would have been information useful sooner <laughs> um, because I almost ran my car off the road for this high school game I don't care about because I'm like, what happened? Um, so I think it's important to be, you know, to have that excitement, but also, you know, hey, what's the final score? What, you know, what's the result? All of that, um, because that's all still important, especially on radio when people can't see what happened. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So I remember a game this past season and um, read a comment from our, when somebody sent an email to you and said, uh, hey, I to listen to you, but every now and then, could you tell us more about the matchup? Like, is it a left-handed pitcher mm -hmm. versus a right-handed batter? Right. And you said that, you know, you thanked the uh, person that wrote in. Mm -hmm. So do you have any kind of a mechanism? No. You, like, I think a, other broadcasters made it were required to mention your station or something. They have a, you know, hour of uh, hour us. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, you know, Red Barber, the great Dodgers Yankees broadcaster back in the day, used to have an egg timer. And, you know, if the sand ran out, he didn't remind him to mention the score again. And he flew over. <laughs> right. um, and uh, uh, I've never done anything like that. I just try to remember, if, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to that point, yeah, I mean, I think it's important, especially, again, on radio, um, to make sure you mention from time to time it's a lefty on the mound, it's a right-handed batter, it's a left-handed batter, what have you. Um, you know, whether it's Astros players or, you know, most of our listeners are going to know, obviously, that Altuve bats right-handed and that Bransley bats left-handed, you know, things like that. But I think it does help to just kind of, because it, it just paints the picture um, when you you hear that. So I think it still helps to, to, you know, to have those those details, which I think sometimes may seem inconsequential or like, you know, well, of course, well, I mean, what's the big deal? And, you know, nowadays, like, well, if they want to know where he bats, they can just look it up on the internet. But, like, I think that still helps to paint the picture. It's still important to have it. So, yes. Will you be traveling with the club this year? I mean, that's the plan, as far as I know. We started traveling um, after the All-Star break last year. And, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just radio did. Um, television, no television crew traveled in the big leagues at all last year. Not a single one. None of the 30 teams. Um, I mean, there was even ridiculous stuff last year. Um, the Mets and Yankees played a series at Yankee Stadium, and the Mets TV crew was doing the game from City Field that was being played at Yankee Stadium, which, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the geography of New York, but I mean, really, that's just two subway lines. You just take the seven and then take the four, and you're right there at Yankee Stadium. Like, it's not that far um, and uh, not that hard to get to. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was really bizarre uh, the way that kind of went down, and it seemed like last year, um, no team wanted to be the first to travel their TV. But I think if one team had started, a bunch of teams were ready to be second. Um, it was it was that sort of thing because, you know, it was this whole thing about saving money and there's some debate as to how much money they really saved. Um, and then on the radio side, um, you know, we were more fortunate, but not every team traveled radio. It was, if I remember correctly, it was 11 teams that traveled radio. So only about a third of the big league teams traveled their radio during the season. Um, and, you know, in the postseason, uh, everybody traveled. Um, well, that's not true. Not everybody traveled. The Dodgers did not. And if the Dodgers, because remember, there's the Dodgers Braves in the NLCS. If the Dodgers had won the NLCS, they still weren't sure if they were going to travel for the World Series um, for radio, which is incomprehensible to me um, that you wouldn't at that point, you know, the biggest games you're playing in your franchise, uh, why, why you wouldn't travel for that. Um, and the Brave, Braves radio, they did travel for the World Series, and they had been traveling uh, in the latter part of the regular season. Uh, but, yeah, the plan is, as far as I know, I haven't been told any different. The plan is for us to still travel. Um, I'm assuming TV will travel as well, although uh, I don't, I can't say that I, I know that for certain, but I think that was kind of the expectation at the end of the year. Um, Obviously, with what's going on with the pandemic, that can always change things. But the plan is for us to travel again. And boy, I hope that's the case because 
doing games off television monitors did yeah. one did wonders for my uh, sanity or insanity as it were. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah, uh, David, David Jerome. Oh, online, David. David is there with Shirley Burton, by the way. I oh. <clears throat> David, you were waving. Did you have a question for uh, Romer? Um, no, I wasn't waving. I didn't hear you very But no, uh, okay. no. Sure, sure. I can't hear you. Did have a question? <laughs> I did. I did not have a question. No, I apologize. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Shirley's sitting here on camera. And Shirley I'm here. off to the side. Oh, okay. You were waving. I thought you had a question. Sorry, right, David. It's good to hear your voice. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, Robert, I'm looking forward to this. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mike, did you want to have uh... <laughs> uh, a Huh? Very quick, yeah, very quickly. Then... Are you sure <laughs> Mike McCross, he's going to talk about vintage baseball real fast. Yeah, real quick. Uh, the committee got together our executive committee, and we came up with an idea about uh, how we could publicize Sabre to get more members. Uh, so we decided maybe we would do a Sabre exhibition. I haven't gotten that far on it, but I've talked with Bob Blair, who's taken over the management ship of the Houston Babies. And I talked with Bob Cox, who does the Boston, uh, Bob Copas, who does the uh, Cypress Block, Cypress Red Sox, Barker Cypress, and uh, Tom Flores with the uh, Katie Combine. And they're all interested. I talked to Tom today. He's up to about four players. But we all have uniforms, and uh, so we're looking to get like a park at uh, Reserve a Field at Memorial Park in the next couple of months, and maybe the Katie Field. They have one really good. Uh, field out there in Katy where we played games before and get the three teams and maybe play a round robin of uh, like six inning games. Bill Brown has volunteered to help with the publicity and take photos. We have new uniforms. I'm glad for that. When we did the Sabre convention, we had a silent auction. We have brand new uniforms. Our older uniforms, I used to play and my daughter Megan would run for them. We played out in Sealy, and uh, with the family days of so between games, she and I went and played egg talk. And she threw me a line drive that broke all over my shirt. When I got home, I put it in the pile for laundry. And my dog, our golden retriever, smelled the egg and ate my jersey. So <laughs> I was really happy to get a new uniform. <laughs> and the old one was kind of ragged. And, uh, so, and I've joined the vintage, the National Vintage Baseball League on top of it, on behalf of the Houston Babies. They have a World Series up there every year. I didn't know that, but Bob Blair has a dream to go play it, and it's in Michigan. And so hopefully we can get, uh, and he's also, he's been involved in amateur baseball softball in Houston for a long time. And there's a true guy, Joe Bogovich, that makes his last name, but he has over 600 amateur players. He's in charge of all the leagues. And Bob's talked to him about contacting all these people. So if we can get the game scheduled in the field, then we don't have enough players and we can get some of those guys out. We'll have more players that can play. For those of y'all that are not used to uh, we're a vintage baseball. It's we play 1860 rules. It's kind of like a hardball version of slow pitch, but they're different rules. Wherever the ball hits, it's fair. No matter where it winds up, catch it on one bounce, you're out. Uh, if you catch a line drive, you get to go back to the base free, but that's different rules. Um, but anyway, it's a lot of fun and it, it the Houston Babies was the Houston's first team in the Texas League. And they, they also won the first game in the Texas League against Galveston, where we recreated that game five or six years ago. 
So the other reason I'm here today, but I should have it all worked out by the next meeting. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to do that. And I'll talk to you, Bill, about your ideas. So uh, my daughter, who also played for the Houston Babies, and is the youngest woman to score a run at the Skeeters Fields. Uh, part of the rules is you can have a pinch runner, and I couldn't run. So I would go hit my daughter, Megan, would run for me. Uh, Sure that yeah. But hey, with with her running, we ne we never had an out. So, uh, but anyway, uh, she is engaged to a fine young man, Nick Thornquist, who played baseball at UTSA. Nick got his degree in mechanical engineer. He was a all state catcher twice at Dallas Flower Mound, and he. Went to US, UTSA on a baseball scholarship for the sole purpose of getting his engineering degree. But a funny thing happened in this past year. He got an extra year of eligibility because of COVID. And he had more hours to complete because of the baseball schedules. He did graduate with an A average. Uh, but he had a really good year. He was named the top college catcher in the state of Texas. Wow. He was a fine one of the 17 semifinalists for the Buster Posey Award as the top catcher in the nation. Uh, and all of a sudden, he became a draft prospect. He went on vacation with my wife and Megan and me in June. And he had a lot of scouts calling him from different teams. Uh, he was getting kind of frustrated. So I asked him if he'd like me to call Tal Smith. And I did, and Tal was gracious enough to counsel him and give him some good advice that helped him settle down a little bit. He didn't like to admit he was a little riled up. But uh, anyway, he went through the draft. He didn't get drafted. But 30 minutes later, the Chicago White Sox called him and made him a better offer than he would have gotten had he got drafted in the bottom part of the lineup. So he went to spring training. He got a bonus. He invested his money fairly well. Look at my daughter's left hand. Spent <laughs> some of the money well. but So he, he went to Birmingham for a few weeks, and then he went to rookie ball in Arizona in, uh, for about six weeks. Mr. Durrell said, well, that's something none of us have ever done. So it would make mine coming here and speaking about how, he, how it was to all of a sudden become a professional, you know, graduate from college in June and be a professional ball player in August. So without further ado, Mr. Nick, you're on. And I wore the White Sox jersey so y'all could boo me. I'm used to that. <laughs> Mike, you forgot to say that Nick played for the babies already this year. I did. Okay. That's right. I didn't do very well. I was <laughs> missing with a lot of but yeah, so I grew up in Dallas, uh, played high school ball there, and kind of grew up on the, everybody's saying, a little short, a little short to be a catcher, small to be a catcher. I'm like, okay, fine, I'm used to it. You saw doing all that stuff. Um, and then senior year in high school, I got, I got two offers to play college baseball. I was at junior college. One was in Rico, and one was at Hill, not far from there. So when you got to play at uh Clinic Community College didn't play my first year. Uh, I was third string on that team. Got, I think it was 30 at bats because we'd be winning by enough to where they put me in. Um, from there, my next year got to be the second string on the team. And UTSA gave me a call and said, Hey, willing to give you a chance. I, I'd love to keep playing. I want to get my degree in engineering. And I wouldn't play at UTSA. Still thinking, Hey, might not be the starter, but just keep trying to play. Keep playing. Uh, come to find out, had a good year in my first year at UTSA. Then COVID struck the next year. And it was, it was funny going into the last year. I'm like, I talked to Megan, my family, some of my really good friends. I'm like, I think I'm all ready to hang it up. What I'm done. I think it's it's my time. And they're like, just give it, a, give it one more year, play it out. You got to go to school anyway. It's like, all right, I'll give it the fall if I don't. I think it's time to be done. Call it quits. And had a good fall, went into the string year. Uh, ended up having probably yeah, my best year baseball ever, and kind of just started flowing through. And it's draft day, nothing happens, don't get picked. I'm like, well, 
hugging my parents, like, hey, it was fun. I loved it. Got to people thought I was good finally. You know, as I grew up, everybody's like, he's good, not great, not good enough. Um, so hugging my parents and then one of the scouts calls and say, hey, why don't you come play with us? I'm like, you know what? I love to. Let's let's do it. So they sent me to uh Birmingham, Alabama, uh, with the other uh, 23 people picked, 20 in the draft, and three other free agents with me. So we went up there, and it's kind of funny. You get the first rounder come, comes in about a week later after us, and a nice little like town car. They drive them up. I'm like, oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> it's just an 18 year old, 10 year old nervous to me. I'm like, okay. but he's great, great guys, all amazing people, all the guys from the draft, and worked out there for two weeks. Uh, I, at that time, I hadn't got my COVID shot yet, so they, I got my my vaccine. So and then right before I flew out to Arizona, so right when I get to Arizona, start working out there, and it's at the spring training site, which we share with the Dodgers. Uh, so in rookie ball, we get to use the major league area, like field, all the stuff. So like we get their locker room; it's pretty sweet. You're like, oh, all right, you walk in, you get your jersey set up, everything's nice and pretty for you. You get up there and. Come to find out two days later, I get COVID. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So they stick me up in a hotel for 10 days. And the way they kind of do it is you have to get activated to play because uh, they don't want you to get hurt. They want you to be in the best shape you can before you get on the field. And the next day, I was supposed to get activated, get COVID. So I'm like, oh, great. You know, sit up in a hotel for 10 days, watch all the new draft guys playing. So I'm like following them on my phone and finally get back. And I had to kind of go through the activation stage again. So they worked me out for about a week and a half. And then after that, we did a half, finally got to get in. But rookie ball, you have, so we had 30 of the Americans there and then 30 from the Dominican draft as well. So you got 60 plus people just in one locker room all fighting for nine spots on the field. So you're like, all right, kind of just try to get in as much as you can. So I got in, in the three, three weeks to a month that I was activated. I only got 10 at bats, but it was fine. I got in six different games. Yeah, 10 at bats, but it's kind of promising because I know what they're doing. They want to get the high school kids, the younger guys in there, if they're at bats and rookie ball. But from there, it's kind of like, all right, well, get your feet wet, face some of these, these new arms, some of these guys that are all throwing 95 plus now. It's just how the game's evolved, and you got you to gotta evolve with it, change with it. I know they want you to hit home runs. That's what they want you to do now. It's like, all right, I know a 5A guy like me is probably not supposed to be hitting home runs, but. Got to find a way to do it. So, but yeah, that was my uh, my first short season. So, I, as of now, I'm supposed to head back probably mid February. Start uh, our spring training, which I've heard for me as a catcher is five hours bullpens, and then you uh, I'm like getting that here and there, and I'm like, all right, well, let's get ready for it. But either way, no, I'm uh, I'm super grateful for Mr. Crossy back there. He's uh, sat my back all along this whole journey that. He's been a part of with me at UTSA and uh, obviously his daughter, who my fiance now, she has been nothing but amazing to me, supportive. And uh, yeah, thank you for letting me come speak to you. It's good to meet everybody that I have uh, thus far. And hopefully I'll be back at a baby's game here soon. Uh, <laughs> thank you all very much. Yeah. Calling Mr. McCross. <laughs> Will do. Well, we lost a baby's player. Uh, we're always looking for Houston babies players to play vintage baseball. And believe me, if I can get out there and slide into home plate without actually going around the bases, yeah, uh, did that. Any of y'all can play vintage baseball. <laughs> so I was safe, and Mike called it too. <laughs> but if you haven't got a copy of Houston Astros Golden Era. I highly recommend everybody get a copy of this book. It's for a good cause. It's uh, for the Houston Food Bank, right? Yeah. Um, we have a special I'm sorry. I'm just rambling on. I'm sorry. Are you designated for golf club the next year? Right? Yeah, so when I've talked to them, they talked about, you know, Canapolis, that's a lot of other food that they'll put there. Uh, well, well, which is high. So it's going to be one of those two that will send it to you. Wow. That the White Sox farm system struggled last year, so it's a good opportunity to have that. 
I think they might have been that, that group of uh, 22 show losses. <laughs> <laughs> they got, they got your people. Anybody else got a question for Nick? Thanks, Mike. Look, Mike's watching out. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so if you haven't had a copy, uh, if you don't have a copy of this, three great writers here. You got Bill Brown, Mr. Astros historian himself, Mike Acosta. And I haven't met Phil yet. No, so uh, all three of them are going to talk about the book for a few minutes. And um, they'll even autograph it for you if you don't have a copy of it. So without further, further ado, Bill, Mike. You guys heard me already, so I'm going to be very brief. I'm not even going to talk about the book, but I will talk about uh, the fact of writing a book. Are interested in becoming a self-author, self-publisher, uh, might be curious about that process. So why do you go to Amazon versus a publisher, an old-fashioned publisher, we might say? Well, because you're probably not going to get published. That's why you go to Amazon. Um, but there are some advantages to it. And Mike and I worked with with the Price Guy Press here, which is not in business anymore. They did a fine job on an Astros history book we did, which was a what, eight nine years ago. Coffee table, great photos of the team's history. That was fun, um, and I had to talk Jim Crane into spending seventy thousand dollars. And this is the difference between being a self published book. So on Amazon. How much did we have to put down to do this book? Zero. Preferable for most of us. <laughs> um, and certainly for me. And of course, it wasn't the expensive type book that uh, Bryce Guy Press did. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty basic book, as you've seen. There are limitations to, you know, color would cost too much to do color photos in the book. So that's out. But if you want to do a relatively inexpensive book and take it upon yourself. And this would be in terms of marketing the book, writing the book, editing the book. And some of those services, of course, would be a part of working with a publisher. A publisher would give you an editor probably as a part of your upfront fee, uh, would also give you some help marketing or do the marketing and maybe uh, set up some appearances to promote the book, things of that nature. So all that is on you if you do your own book. But if you are the type of person who's considering doing a book, has something to say, wants to be published and is willing to put in the work on it, it's all your decision. And uh, you just get a free account with Amazon. Doing the book is not all that difficult. Writing it, of course, is something. Uh, editing it is something. And then just going through the final checks before you decide to put it up for sale. That's that's your final prop. So that final weekend, and Tal really helped me more than anybody, and Phil helped me too. I, I went in, I was getting into the panic stage because there were way too many mistakes in this book. So that's what they helped me with. Finding the mistakes. And it went into this build back better uh, phase. Um, you know, you better change make some serious changes here or this thing is not fly. And so that occurred over about three days, and then we we put it out. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm glad we did it. I, what I would like for Mike to talk about briefly is uh, how do you package history? Because not as many people are interested in history anymore. We know that this this organization is primarily, but a lot of people aren't. And then Phil wrote a lot of the book, uh, good best and worst trades. Uh, Things uh, like um, Andres Reiner developing the Venezuelan market. He contributed a lot of those sections of the book. So, Mike, how about you? Thanks, Brownie. Well, I want to say uh, thanks to Brownie for, for having Phil and I as part of this project because, uh, as you guys know, uh, history, Astros history, baseball history is something that we love. And very well versed in and can kind of speak the language. And so it was it was a lot of fun to, to be part of another book project with Brownie. But like you said, how do you package uh, history, you know, for, for people to really get engaged with it? And, 
you know, I, I've put together different exhibits uh, at Minute Maid Park and different projects, in different locations, and kind of done some stuff online. And I've been engaged with some some other baseball fans online and kind of talked to them. And uh, baseball is it's it's very visual. Uh, people love seeing historical photos. They like seeing artifacts. They like uh, being able to to be right there and, and see something that was that was part of history. And so, how do we how do we integrate that into the book to kind of further along the the text? And so, there's there's a process, right? When you get rights to photos, uh, you have to go through the team, and sometimes there's some challenges with that. So we had to get a little creative. And I, I've been a memorabilia collector since I was probably 10 years old when I used to go to the sports shows over at the Astrodome. We used to go to the Dome Scholar and I used to take five or 10 bucks with me and try to get what I want. And that built up to now where I own a lot of older vintage Astros jerseys and uh, all sorts of other things that used to be in the Astrodome. And I built it up for, you know, better part of 30 something years. And so I told Bill, I said, why don't we take photos of these artifacts that are coming out of private collection and we can put that into the book and that can tie back to some of these great moments that are the, the stories that are being told in there and so he thought that was a, a really good idea and I said then we can also promote it on uh, social media like on twitter we create some slides and put those images there so that way people know that they're seeing a real deal they're not just kind of looking at, I mean, everybody can see a player photo, but I had acquired uh, this past year, the the, uh, the state auction had come up for, for Judge Roy Hoffines. I had actually bought a lot of stuff. And so in it were private photos, some other things that didn't belong to the team. So we just used it. <laughs> I, I told Bill, I said, well, let's just put this to use. I said, I bought it to protect it. And to get it into my collection, but now, I mean, this is kind of what I always envisioned it for, where we could we could actually take pictures of it and, and use it to showcase to people. So we uh, we did that, and it, I think it turned out really well, and the response has has been good, and it's it's for a good cause. And again, um, you know, it just have to people. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people here also like reading and text and reading stories. But there's a lot of people who really are visual. They like to see uh, the colors. And the Astros have had a, a very colorful history, We're from the uniforms uh, to the green AstroTurf and all of that. So seeing that, and, and one of the things that, that I find it's, it's kind of cool in a way, we I mean, had these rainbow jerseys in the books. Back when they were going to the rainbow jerseys, the, the some, some of the, yeah, someone mentioned, uh, that if you saw the Astros on TV, and of course this was the emergence of, of uh, color television in the 70s, but there was still a lot of black and white broadcasts. They said it didn't matter if you were going to watch the Astros in black and white because you would see those rainbow stripes and those shades of gray, and you would still know it was the Astros. So that still shines through in this book. So uh, to me, that was that was the uh, most engaging part, I think, of the uh, the book and of course uh bill you want to come up and, and talk and, and again i just want to say thanks to brownie for for uh asking me to be part of this project and any anytime <laughs> it's always great working thank you thanks, man. i also appreciate brownie inviting me to come do this this all kind of came up with the you know, pretty much of the last minute but, <laughs> but uh i am just thrust into a uh into retirement or whether I want retirement or not, it was going to happen for me. So um, it became a great project to work on. Uh, but my stuff is more the history stuff. Um, my, what I've been able to do with Brownie and with uh, the guys who first started with HSE back in the day, and now with Todd Callis and, and Blummer, um, is I get to sit with them and watch baseball games and get paid for. What a gig. <laughs> um, I, I never, my mother could never figure out how I was going to make any money doing, uh, you know, being involved with this stuff. And so I've actually found a way to do that. And my job is to try and make Ronnie and, and Todd look smart. So I find hand them things or whatever else. And in the days when the Astros were really bad in 2013, 
I could find 50 reasons of things I could hand them that they couldn't use because they weren't going to say anything bad about the team. But I had plenty of things to go there. But the, the thing that got me kind of on and looking at this was what we don't, I think, um, look at as far as baseball goes, expansion, and we looked at this as the start of the team. Um, in 1961-62, baseball's had five expansions uh, in reality since, since um, when we went from eight teams in each league to going to be what it is now, 30 teams. In its expansion, um, in 1962 and 1961, there was no blueprint. There was no free agency. There was no draft. There was no given way you're going to build a team. Um, Houston and uh, and Washington Senators um, were unique because they weren't playing in other markets. Houston, more than anything else, was um, was quite removed from everything else that was happening at that point in time. The Angels were playing in Anaheim against the Dodgers. The Mets were playing in New York against the Yankees. They had to go out and look for veteran ball players more so than the Astros and the and the uh, and the, the Senators did. So everybody had a little different approach. The, the free agent draft, the minor league draft, um, didn't happen until 1965. So it was trying to get in people's houses and the Astros signing a rusty stop, convincing him, yes, we really have a major league baseball team in Houston and we want you to play in, the, in, play in our system here. Um, that was not an easy sell in many cases if you weren't in the general area. Um, so how the team was built, um, there really wasn't a blueprint for it. Um, the Astros, and there were no there were no free agents you could sign to supplement the roster like there are today. And we've seen this with the, the Seattle and, and Toronto expansions and the ones since then, where you could supplement your rosters or players. The, the Astros signed a couple of players, I think, from uh, that were old Houston buffs to try and help beyond that first couple of, uh, of teams they had. So they, there was a lot of, of um of finessing and figuring out how to make them there. But the Astros went into this with a lot of people who never heard of. And one of the things that I came across, and this is one of the things I keep in my, my book, I have this big binder I carry in my, when I go off to the baseball game. Um, and it's, it's for weird, obscure facts in case I get a chance to give something to the announcer. And that, like, and this was, I was talking to the guys at the table about this. Um, we all, being longtime Astro fans, are, are Hold Bob Astromonte to be in high esteem. I did not realize, in going back and looking at this, that in the 1963 team, um, and the Colt 45s were really, really bad in 1963. Um, he actually had five walk off hits. Um, and walk off hits really aren't a, you know, you, you look at it's a stat, but it's not really a stat. It's hard to find and do this. But I'm starting to do this. He had, Astro had, in his seven years of playing with the Astros, had seven, um, had, you know, had 11 walk-off hits. That's almost you know, one and a half, almost two a year. That's a pretty tremendous number for a really bad team in the 60s. The, the Afters and Colt were really, were really challenged at that point in time. Um, the other thing that kind of came up in, in looking at this stuff for me was um, the deals, the good deals, the bad deals. But also, we've been blessed to have really good um, people at second base. We've had, we're going to be having our third I would expect Hall of Fame player um, to play second base for the Astros and Jose Altuve. Um, but second base and then third base was also one of those positions that third base had been very solid for the Astros. And those two positions probably has been their best positions. Astros other than Carlos Correa and Sonny Jackson had not really developed the shortstop they've signed themselves. They've really struggled to have people that, I mean, they always have people they've brought in from other teams but shortstops are generally the best athletes you get. But we, you know, we talk about some of those things. Um, so, uh, you brought up about, uh, uh, or uh, Robert brought up about uh, Brian Bannister and, and Floyd Bannister. We have some little thing in there about um, the Astros' first round draft choices, about the first picks in draft and how they did. But Floyd Bannister was their first time the Astros had the first pick in draft. Um, and this was in the middle of a, a talent creation of the Arn Farm, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the book. Um, but Tal, what, what Tal did in, in the 75 through 77 era when he took over the, the team there is he was dealing with free agency, which was new. Um, the amateur draft was still was finally starting to get its right where it belonged, how you're going to put people into it. Um, whether people are going to come directly to the majors, where you're going to spend time in the minor leagues. 
how that was all going to happen. It was just getting to that point. But what, what the Astros did in the late 70s was a teardown that really hadn't been done a lot in baseball because in baseball, the only assets you had were your players. And so trading veterans really wasn't necessarily thought that would be a good idea. So we talked a little bit about those. But those are the sorts of stories that I kind of contributed to this and some different perspectives on it. Um, but doing the research, I mean, most of it I remember, but I didn't remember it from, I remember it from being a kid going through, it, not from being kind of being a, a little 10,000 foot level and looking back at as much, but kind of fun stuff that way. So, um, but Brownie might have enjoyed it. And yes, I'm up uh, whatever you got next, okay? I'm uh, shaving. Okay. Books are available today. Books are available, yes. You might. <laughs> Any questions, Pam? Okay. Um, well, Tony, you want to say anything about the newsletter? And we are still looking for what? One more article? I think that's right. Yeah, that was a uh, we are always looking for people to contribute to our chapter newsletter. Uh, we are always looking for subjects uh, for the newsletter. So the next one is coming out next month, the end of this month. Bob? Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. And I think Scott, that's right. Scott sent the email. If Fox Tony Phil sees the shadow, it'll come out earlier or something. <laughs> so. All right, I'll just say a few words about the shooting stars. As I have been reminded, the shooting stars logo, fantastic major league first class logo, was developed by Big McCroskey. That's right. <laughs> and it really is pretty good. So, uh, our next issue, Groundhog's Day, give me a break. Okay, that's uh, in springtime. So, the contents we'll have is uh, something from Bill Brown. Uh, a uh, kind of a New Yorker type series article on uh, Taos Smith, which is going to be really good. We'll have a trivia contest. Uh, other articles are being developed. I'm thinking that maybe it might, might have a few words on the new Hall of Famers. Mm -hmm. It may, may be good to remember those folks and some book reports. Uh, there's a new great book on the Cleveland Indians in 1948. A lot of things happen. Uh, um, Mr. Robinson was a first baseman of the Indians at that time, and he just he just passed away. Uh, great hitter, great individual. Anyway, those are some of the uh, things that we're going to have in the next issue. So it should be pretty good. All right, All right. good. Please. Uh, sounds good. Okay, Tony. Uh, also, won uh, the opportunity to write this month's trivia contest. So, um, while Tony, um, some of the guys back here, we see their pictures. They gave us really impossible trivia contest. So I would aspire to be that bad. That just right, Lucas is the library, or is he in the bar? There, <laughs> <laughs> but they've Tony, you want to pass out? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what I think we can do for those online who want to participate, Tony will write a, read the question. Read the question. And uh Joe, are you gonna announce about Saber Day or has Yeah, um thanks, Mike. Started? Mike's doing a very good job <laughs> keeping me out. I know who he really is. <laughs> um by the way, by the way I do, I, what's that? I do want to make a comment. Go ahead, Greg. I set a record tonight. I was the first member of Sabre to ever start the meeting at the meeting and finish in at home on Zoom. Oh, and tell them I got my wallet. <laughs> I think he's at the bar and that's a pretty fact. <laughs> Sabre Day in America is February 5th. Um, Chris, your presentation will probably have to hold for the next month. Um, some of the things we've done in the past for Saber Day in America is get together, have like a lunch, exchange books, exchange memorabilia. We can do that. The Roger Hornsby chapter is doing a Zoom thing. We can certainly do that. Um, but I would like to get together if we could on February 5th, either via Zoom or here or something or somewhere or like a hybrid like we're doing here. We can talk about our favorite baseball books for reading. Right now, we talk a little bit about the Dalco book. 
Uh, if somebody wants to go through this and talk about this book a little bit on February 5th, you know, um, whatever you want, whatever you want to do. February 5th, Saturday. Baseball fans, we all have a favorite piece of memorabilia with Matt, and we've each brought a piece of memorabilia and culture that. And once downtown, we took a little meeting room at uh, Jack's Cafe across the street. It was reserved on behalf of Saber for February 5th, should you choose to use it. Oh, okay. So we okay. could meet. Uh, and then we've done a book exchange, and I think we even uh, played a baseball game one time at this proponents. But it was just a demo get together and talk baseball. And I think we did it one for Saber Day, and once and we didn't have a meeting in July. No. Uh, kind of an open forum, but uh, yeah, people have brought gloves, the ball they saw, or the best baseball card, or their baseball card collection. So much Boudreaux at the big ones. Uh, <laughs> so that we can do that. We can tell right. exchange Joaquin and Duhar stories. Joaquin and Duhar. That's right. 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 Well, we can do that. I'll, I'll send something out and uh, we'll work on it. Okay. All right. So time. All right. Question. See? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. so we're doing teams. What's that? Are we doing teams? No, it's every man for himself. Oh, okay. <laughs> dog eat dog. Uh, okay, I, I have okay. I also some trivia questions, which I thought I was specialized in managers tonight, which is a really overlooked topic. So uh, I have a few questions about managers and uh, other things. My first question is this. Uh, for many years, Gil Hodges held an unenviable World Series record. Do you folks know what it was? Yeah. Uh, the second question. Which manager holds the record for most ejections by an umpire? Third. Well, I mean, online, are you getting that? Uh, yeah, great. Okay, all right, cool. So, okay. Uh, third question. Connie Mack managed the Philadelphia aid for 50 years. Who succeeded him? Number four, John McGraw managed the New York Giants for 31 years. Who succeeded John McGraw? Walter Alston succeeded Charlie Dressen as manager of the Dodgers. Who succeeded all? How many teams were managed by Jimmy Dykes? Dykes was involved in a very famous trade in 1960. What happened? Name the last team owner who also managed his club. All field. And this is a post-1900 question. Which players won the batting title in their leagues with the highest batting average? And secondly, who won the batting title in their respective leagues with the lowest winning batting average? So three movie questions. Same. Post-1900? Yeah, post-1900. The uh, 19th century averages were really inflated. The same before the 1860 rules. So they're both leagues or just one player? Oh, no, let's, let's do both leagues. The American League and National League, the uh, best, highest batting average, the lowest batting average for the title. A uh, couple of uh, gimmies here. Number 11, who played Babe Ruth in the Babe Ruth story? Number 12, who played Babe Ruth in Pride of the Yankees? And the last one, the question, the, the uh, movie, The Winning Team. Which actors played Grover Cleveland Alexander and his wife? His long-suffering, faithful wife. If you went, it's your trivia question. You have to do the next one. Remember that. Right. See you, Charlie. Okay.
Okay, are are we done? Do you need more time? Who does? Yeah, that's right. Well, the herb has been awesome. Matters. We've been to Canaveral. We've been to Canaveral. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, the point. For many years, Gil Hodges held an unenviable World Series record. What was it? It was in 21 at in 1952. Ooh. Even if Perry Priest was praying for it at that time. I, so. uh, I didn't know this, by the way, he had a small heart attack in 1968. Oh, yes. And then yeah. so passed away a few years later. Yeah. Who was the manager with the most ejections? Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox. I thought he was number two. Did Earl Earl Weaver. Earl Weaver. Remember what yeah, Earl Weaver? Yeah, that was Earl Weaver? No. Bobby Cotton. Bobby Cotton, number one. It was John McGraw. Was what? He was number two. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Well, that's not the question. No, it wasn't, but I thought I'd just throw that in. No, it was <laughs> uh, John McGraw managed the, the New York Giants for 31 years. He succeeded. Uh, uh, yeah, number, number three. Oh, number three. Oh, Connie Mack managed the. I, I'm sorry. Who, Connie Mack managed to live the eight for 50 years. Who succeeded Mack? Jimmy Dykes. Jimmy Dykes. Jimmy Dykes. Yeah. John McGraw managed the New York Giants for 31 years. Who succeeded McGraw's manager? Bill Terry. Bill Terry. Bill Terry. Bill Terry. Bill Terry. Uh, Walter also succeeded Charlie Dressen as manager. Who succeeded Austin? Tommy And Schumer to work. How many teams were managed by Jimmy Dykes? Five. Six. 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 Did I hear another number? One. No, he managed the, the A's, the White Sox, Detroit, uh, Cleveland. Cleveland, Baltimore, and uh, somebody else. Welcome to the job. I mean, they always hire me. You got the Reds on there? Yeah, Cincinnati. He was there with the Reds. The Reds, the White Sox. What's the right answer? Uh, six. I got it. Six. Right. He was involved in a very famous trade himself in 1960. Frank Lane traded. Frank Lane traded men. Who? Sean Russell. Oh, I know. Last one. That wasn't the question. What happened? Yeah, very famous trade. Uh, Frank Lane did this to him. He traded. Uh, Joe Gordon. Gordon. Tra traded Frank Jimmy Dykes. Or Joe Gordon. Yeah, Joe Gordon. 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 Oh, Detroit is late. Uh, the uh, name the last team owner who also manages the club. Oh, I thought I didn't begin that. He still lost. Uh, which player? Which players won the batting titles in their league with the highest batting average? Let's try. You don't be a Roger Ford. Well, this is a uh, after 1900. That's right. 420 and 420. That's right. I got it. And the <laughs> lowest bag. The Skrinsky at 301. Sternweiss. George Sternweiss. The Skrinsky and his Skrinsky at 301. Yeah, 301. In 1978. 301. And his yeah. so actually like, Tony Gwynn were at 313. Yeah, 13. In 1988. How many is that one? 1.3 <clears throat> okay. Correct answer. Who played Babe Ruth in the Babe Ruth story? William Bendis. Who played Babe Ruth in Pride of the Angels? Babe Ruth. He's got a tough. In the winning team, which actors played Grover Cleveland Alexander and Pride? Very good. And there you are. Are you saying one you played Grover Cleveland Alexander's wife? Jane Playground. 
Nancy, right? Yeah. No. Ronald Reagan in a dual role. <laughs> So I don't know how she wound up with that movie, but that's even like one point. So no, well, I got a lot. I super like one point. Good, good, which is a strange combination. That's all I got. Oh, I actually, I don't work. Well, let's see. Oh, actually, yeah. Oh, uh, I see it. Tally. Am I good? I mean, how many answers? How many people you got? Yeah. How many answers? Mark, you get 10? Anybody got 11? About 12? Nice. Well, I think most of these. John, how many did you get? I got eight. I got eight. 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 So, Mike, it looks like you're the Greg Lucas. Lucas. No, Greg Lucas. Yeah. The Lord actually still counting his eyes. How are you at, Greg? Refer to the books. Where are you, really? Barsha? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm uh, I'm in my office at home. I actually started the meeting with you and then came home. Um, how much? What was the total number you could get? I think it's twenty-one. Twenty-one? Yeah. Oh. Well, I think I must have gotten nine. The cost of it. Mike, I think you were looking at. Team was the most. Big shoot. Oh, there. Oh, there. One, two, three, four, five. Well, Mike, it's more than eight, right? Anybody beat ten? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was counting six. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And uh, see you then. Thank you, Kelly. What's the date of the next meeting? February 21st. February 21st. Classes are safer day, thank you, we're playing. February 5th. Chris. Yes, I got that.